today is November 5th. It's 11.01 and I call this meeting of the board to order. Um, today we're uh, continuing to discuss and make decisions on um, some of the finer points of our regulations. Um, today, specifically, we're going to be talking about issues, uh, discussing issues about local governance, um, inspections, compliance and enforcement mechanisms, um, appeals, and a continued discussion around the priority of licensure. Uh, before we turn to the agenda, um, just wanted to give a quick update on the social equity town halls that the board has been working to plan. Um, so just to back up a second, we've made recommendations, the board has made recommendations on the criteria that would qualify an applicant as a social equity applicant, but we really felt that it was important to not get too far ahead of the public um, as to how we um, can really ingrain equity into the cannabis industry um, without the input of the people and the communities that have been actually impacted. So we've been working to develop a few hybrid, in-person and remote town hall style meetings um, around the state. Um, the dates that we're looking at are November 18th, um, which is a Thursday, and that would be an after hours um, town hall. And then Saturday, November 20th. And currently we're looking at Winooski and Bennington as the locations. Um, but we are in the process of reaching out to um, some stakeholders to really develop the format and the agenda for those town hall meetings. Um, we'll continue dis to discuss these um, in our meetings here, um, as well as keep our website up to date um, with any of the kind of specifics around times, locations, and agendas. Is there anything either Bryn or Julie or Kyle would like to add with respect to the town halls? Uh, only that we're really looking forward to hearing feedback from the public. Um, I think the social equity subcommittee has done a really good job of um, framing some ideas and I know that they really want to hear from the community and people who would be impacted by the plans that they're proposing. I agree and don't have anything further to add. Yep. Okay. Um, then uh, I think we should move to the agenda, but first uh, we should approve the minutes from 1029. Um, I did make a slight change to the minutes that were posted, just clarifying that the conversation around transfers is really about transfers from medical licensees, dispensary licensees, to their integrated license component. Um, and I just, it was more of a clarification than a substantive change. But with that edit, I take a motion. Uh, so moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, um, the agenda today, we're gonna start with Julie um, to talk about lo local governance and the priority of licensure for their continued discussion. Um, am I also gonna talk about the ID card? Yes, okay. if you'd like to. meeting with our mission um, and then I was looking at local, um, local rules for local governance so the legislation allows us to um, adopt rules relating to a municipality's is issuance of a local license um, it also references that local governments have authority to condition the licenses under 24 VSA 414 uh, 4414 and 2291 uh, 4414 talks about zoning uh, primarily, and then um, 2291 talks about some of the other enumerated powers for municipalities. So really, this is more of a, um, a problem analysis than it is about uh, actually proposing some rules because we, you know, we spent some time with uh, local governments. Um, this is kind of all of the conversations that I've had over the last several months related to local government getting input. Um, we also had the um, uh, municipal survey and roundtable, which really produced, you know, the result was local government said, we have a lot of rules already, we have a lot of zoning authority already, 
What we really, really need is clarity on what the Cannabis Control Board will do. We've already um, proposed you know, some recommendations that will impact local governments. Um, I guess what I'm, what I'm, all of these slides are to say, I don't think we need any more rules <laughs> than we actually need, right? So I think we need to recognize as we're making our rules that the local uh, uh, zoning ordinances and bylaws and town plans exist um, and try to do our best not to conflict with those um, too much. But the only rule I would propose is that for the first three years, towns require, uh, are, are required to track data. Um, the purpose of tracking this data is twofold. One, I think it will give us some, some market information that we might like to have in the future. Second is, when we were discussing the fees, we heard from municipalities that you know the fees that we were proposing weren't enough, but there wasn't enough information from those towns to decide what that fee actually should be. So if we track some data for the first couple of years, um, I think at the end of that time we'll have a better sense of what those fees should look like. Or what the cost actually yeah. is to the local government. I mean, this is the, the rub that we have, is that in order to recommend a fee, we also have to justify that fee. And what we've failed to hear is the real justification, well, largely because this is a new industry and we've right. never had to do, we've never had to do this before. Anytime you require data tracking, um, it can be a expensive proposition. Um, if we do go with the, if the legislature ends up going with the fee structure where you actually have to keep track of your time for processing, um, you know that that will get transferred to the to the cannabis board, so we'll be able to okay. understand that. Um, so we don't need to ask them to track that if, if that's the. So we'll have that. We, we right. can track it. The local efforts for compliance enforcement. I mean, it's important. That's essentially what we need if we're going to increase the fee. Mm -hmm. So I would like that data. I don't know about requiring. I think if people want to increase their, if, if they want to propose a justification for an increased fee, then they would have to be supported by. So we, we could either require it or we could strongly recommend it. Yeah. I like the strongly recommend it yeah. route, mm -hmm. considering some towns are going to feel differently about this. And if they want to come to us and say, we need a higher fee, we need, we need to see why. Because we haven't, as the chairman alluded to, really seen that administrative burden in real time yeah, and understanding what it means. If we were to require it, we would need to make it simple enough for a town that has right. just an elected board that's also doing their administration. Right. And I, you know, I don't know if we can do that. So I went back and forth in my mind. I landed on requiring, but I'm not. We can. We could strongly recommend it instead. Yeah. I, I think it's an incentive. If, if they do want to hire a fee, they need to show us why. I, I, yeah, I, I'm with the strongly recommend. Yeah. Okay. So the other things I think we should just discuss because we're in a public setting and I think it's helpful to discuss these things is what the towns will really need is clear guidance um, and probably some direct outreach from the board about the rules that we do create, um, at, you know, direct education, whether it's infographics or webinars um, from us. Um, we'll probably need to revisit that municipal input process after implementation to see, you know, how things are going, where the gaps are, and we should probably consider the type of staffing that are, is needed for that type of dedicated education, at least in the first couple years. David, how binding are the FAQs that we release on a town? They're not binding on anybody. Yeah. They're they're just information. But yeah, you could you could choose to take an FAQ and try to transform it into some sort of a rule, but how binding, the FAQs themselves. Yeah, how binding are they on us? They're not binding on us. They're not binding on us. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, it's something we've been asked for repeatedly. I mean, in every other state has them, so we might as well have them too. But. Okay. Yep, yep. Okay. 
So cannabis establishment identification cards. So I've included the um, legislation. So every owner, principal, and employee of a cannabis establishment uh, must obtain an identification card. Part of that is a background check. Um, process that goes with the issuance of that card or the, the approval or denial of that card. Um, I looked at some past meetings and discussions that we've had that sort of touch on this. Um, also some other states that are doing this. Um, and of course our relevant statute. And I looked at our, our um, current medical rules because they are doing this for medical dispensaries now. Just to kind of make a comparison. So for owners principles, owners and principals, this should just be part of the application process. Um, and we should issue those ID cards when we issue the license. Um, for employees, though, um, because that won't necessarily, an employment won't necessarily happen at the time of the licensing, um, it's a little bit different. So when an employer uh, or a cannabis establishment hires someone, they should submit all of the information that's needed to process the background check and the application at the same time, including um, the receipt from a fingerprint identification center so that we know that the fingerprint's been taken. Um, and then, it, you know, I wrote in here that employers should reimburse for the fingerprint collection. Most employers that, that do this are already doing that sort of um, uh, reimbursement. This um, kind of ties into the other question, of course, which is if an employer, if you're not you're not getting your employee license ID card tied to a specific employer or establishment, then who's going to reimburse? Right. So if we if we make a recommendation to detach those, and the legislature does that, um, honestly, I think employers might do that anyway um, because it's a benefit to them um, and it's attractive as a benefit for an employee, um, but they wouldn't necessarily. Yeah, I just see that shall language, but I guess if we are able to decouple the employee ID from the cannabis establishment, we could revisit the shall. Right, so I wrote this the way that um, the legislation is written, okay. yeah. knowing that we would have to revisit it if it, if it looks differently in the end. Okay. So um, once the application is submitted and reviewed, um, the employee or the applicant can get a temporary permit and they can operate at the cannabis establishment with supervision. Um, and the temporary permit will expire when the background check information and the um, permit, the, the permanent one is issued or um, you know when it's denied. I also put in here like a two month kind of buffer um, in case the, it takes a long time for that processing to happen. Um, you know, so if or if it's denied, then that piece of paper that someone's walking around with doesn't have no ending on it. So if we deny a license and they have some temporary permit that someone's not walking around with something that looks like it's active, um, and then uh, background checks, if they're attached to a license, would be done at the time of application at a renewal. So a card could be denied if the applicant is under the age of 20. One, if they're untruthful um, on the application, if it uh, if the record check produces results, and we would follow, and my recommendation is to follow the same process as the licensing um, we talked about on the 22nd. Um, and then also, if they have um, had a, a card revoked in another state, we would need to look closer at the reason why. Yep. Um, and that's sort of what the, the next set of bullets are. And then I just listed the types of things that should be on the application. I realize that this means that people will probably have to fill out multiple forms, but I think there's no way around that. Um, the FBI will require a different format than BCIC, and we will need additional information about past employment um, in order to meet the recommendations that I just made. So it's likely that people will fill out multiple forms for this process. Yeah, it all looks good. And then my next slide was really a discussion point about whether or not we should recommend that the employee card be detached from the license. I think 
think that there's some challenges of having them attached to a license and that the question is, can someone work at multiple establishments? Can they work at multiple different types of establishments? Um, I, I don't know if the assumption was that everyone would have full-time jobs in cannabis establishments. I don't know if that's true. It might be that people have multiple jobs at multiple different establishments. I mean, I like the idea of the flexibility that removing it, removing the tie to a specific establishment provides for the worker. I, you know, to me, I think that's an important piece of this. Um, otherwise, you get locked into one place, and you know, there's a real, you know, barrier to you wanting to leave um, or being able to leave, um, and it's an added cost to the worker if you do decide to leave. So I like having it not tied to the establishment. Um, I don't know what the discussion was. I mean, maybe that's just how it works on the medical side, and so they just imported language from the medical side. Um, but I like, I prefer having the ID follow the employee and not and not the establishment. I agree with that. Yeah. Are we missing anything there, David? No, you're not missing anything. Just to be clear, this will be a recommendation to the legislature because yeah. the, the statute. <clears throat> does attach it right now. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense to help grow a robust industry from a worker perspective, mm -hmm. flexibility where we can. Yeah. On the establishment side too, the way that the legislation is written right now, if you hire someone like in March, for example, and your license is up in April or May, and you have to submit all of that paperwork again. So it is a little bit of a deterrent for hiring at certain times of the year times of the year which might be important. Right. And folks that might be hired on a temporary basis at, at you know harvesting right. time that might not have that same opportunity the yeah. next harvest time. Great. All right. Okay. So um, priority of licensure, I really just I think what I have documented here is where our discussion was really going. Um, so what I put down is that uh, during sort of the implementation phase uh, that will follow a process where we batch our um, applications. Um, one batch would be the first to the 15th day, the next would be the 16th to the 30th day. So we'd look at them in two batches. We would always consider the geographic distribution of cannabis establishments um, as part of this process and the market needs as part of this process. Then within those batches, we would prioritize them in two ways. First, we would have social equity applicants, DEI applicants, that's if we go with the recommendation from the subcommittee, and then all other applicants. Within those, then there would be subsections um, prioritizing by this uh, list A through E. And I didn't, it didn't sound like we were prioritizing list A through E with any type of weight. I think we sort of moved away from that idea in my mind, it's the more of these items that you have, the further up in the processing you go. So for example, a social equity applicant that has four of the items in the se second section on this slide would be above a social equity applicant that has only two or one. So you're moving people within the queue, within their defined bucket. Right. So that, that's where I think things get a little bit uh, tenuous um, from our perspective. And I also don't, what Massachusetts kind of said also is after this initial outlay of licenses, that priority, the prioritization is not gonna matter much because you're not gonna be receiving licenses as quickly. Mm -hmm. I think if we have batches, then we don't need to move people within the batch. But I think what, where I was going was, we have minimum qualifications for A through E. Um, and if you're not meeting those minimum qualifications, then your application is not complete. We send a, we send a request for more information on why don't you have a you know, social equity plan that doesn't meet our minimum standards. Um, and so that, that would give them, a, that would kind of pause their place in, in the queue and they would have a certain amount of time to respond. And if they don't respond within that time frame, then their application is just out. Um, you know, and then once they do respond, they can get back in the queue. Would you do A through E or A through D? Because I think we know that yeah. there'll be a number of applications that won't be yeah. medical dispensaries already. Right. 
Well, I think D would be one of those not required but optional ones. Yeah. Um, you know, because we do want to know if, if we're gonna if we're gonna give any sort of consideration to owning a medical cannabis dispensary outside of Vermont, because I think really the medical dispensaries inside Vermont already have kind of built-in priorities, mm -hmm. um, then we need to consider good standing criteria for E. But it wouldn't be required of every applicant, of course. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, uh, I think A through D would be, I think A through D, yeah, would be, we would create minimum standards and then we'd have some good standing criteria if we're going to consider it we're going to consider that one so i know like <clears throat> last week we talked about what e specifically means right did we did you explore that at we, all or we talked or, about or it last week yeah. too like does this insinuate medical dispensaries from other states coming in here and looking to enter our market or is it tailored more ex explicitly towards the in-state medical i mean the way that it reads, it could go both, <laughs> it could go both ways. Yeah. You know? So I'm just thinking about the intent of the legislature. I think the legislature probably thought we were gonna have residency requirements. So this would only apply to Vermont dispensaries. And they wanted to make sure that, you know, because a Vermont dispensary is entitled to certain privileges, that we would have a layer of review to make sure that they're actually in good standing before right. we give them those pri those privileges. Um, but I don't know. That's that's my take on why E was included. Um, so I think it was really focused on the Vermont dispensaries, but it doesn't read that way. A plain reading doesn't exactly. Yeah, that's why I was wondering about intent. I mean, I don't think we should be prioritizing out of state right. dispensaries coming in in here generally. Just like anybody else can, but. but if you do have a license in another state, I think we would want to know that you're in good standing. We do get at that in other aspects of the licensure. Right. Um, you know, if you have negative enforcement actions against you in another state, that's part of the kind of minimum qualifications. It's something that we would want to look into. Um, Certainly agree there, just from a priority perspective. So one of my other thoughts is about C, because it says propose specific plans to pay employees a living wage and offer benefits. Um, I feel like that's one of those things that a new business either can or may not be able to do, um, or may not even be required to do. So if it's a, I mean, maybe there's some automatic, like, this is obviously a sole proprietorship, so you don't need to, and there's only one person working at it, or like two people working at it. You know, it says propose a specific plan. It could be like once we get to X number of retail sales mm -hmm. or then we would, you know, include this number of employees in the livable wage plan. Um, if you're a sole proprietor, you know, you could say that, you know, I will pay a livable wage to any future employees that I hire, but I can't afford to pay myself a livable wage, et cetera. Um, you know, it's, it's a plan. It's not necessarily you have to do, you have to do this at the outset. Yeah, again, I think all of these are written broadly enough for us to kind of develop guidance about what each one specifically might mean and or entail. And I think your points are very well taken. We can probably develop some kind of guidance or, or create some policy around what, you know, C actually means, recognizing that everybody is starting at a different point. Likely some might be well capitalized, others might not be. but as long as there's a type of plan, you know, that we can see in steps to meet that plan are actually happening happening in practice. I think that's something that we can work out. And it, it touches on, you know, if we had some sort of moving in the queue based upon these criteria and, you know, company A says, I'm gonna pay all my employees a little wage, and company B says, I can't afford to do that, mm -hmm. then company A would get moved higher but really, you know, that's a discretionary point for us and we're not, not considering kind of financial hardship. So it makes things complicated when we start moving things in the queue. That's why I really kind of think having just minimum standards here. No movement in the queue, but minimum standards. Mm -hmm. um, but if we, we could batch though too, I, I think, right. you know. We should do, uh, yes, 
I agree with doing that. And I think this first part, the social equity applicants, the DEI applicants, if we accept that, then all of our applications will be. That's already something we're supposed to do. Right. Okay. Do you have enough direction there, Bryn, for now? Yeah. I think so. Okay. This is a continued discussion, of yeah, course. For sure. This becomes very relevant uh, to a lot of people. I think what we can do, like, because I, I, I said this when we, when I started proposing some environmental resiliency or sustainability criteria early on, is the initial wave is where this is going to matter, but how does it matter after that? And I think as our program hopefully starts to mature, we can develop, like, you know, certain supplemental um, awards or programs that, that could look to a lot of what these A through D specifically mean, and then you can, that might be marketing material, or you can inform your customer base that, hey, I have, you know, done above and beyond what has been asked of me, so on and so forth, and, you know, other states, other programs have these kind of awards at the end of every year for businesses that achieve certain standards within a, what, what a program entails. In Massachusetts, uh, also has penalties, enforcement actions that they can take if you promised something in your application right. and you're not living up to it. You haven't made progress towards uh, that, like you know, promise on the diversity. Uh, or, so, I think we can talk about that also in the, kind of the enforcement section. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is that it? That's it. Oh, all right. We're ahead of schedule. Um, Kyle, do you want to? Sure. Go ahead. We're going to be even more ahead of schedule because I have a total of three slides today. But. I'm getting a stride. Yeah. I'm <laughs> asked to look at cultivation facility inspection standards um, and license renewal and I think a lot of this will kind of set the stage for some of your your presentation um, so cultivation facility inspection what I really was aiming to do here is w was set a baseline of what both license holders and our enforcement division or designee can reasonably expect to happen as it relates to an inspection a lot of these are broad this is pretty uh, I've taken a lot um, through conversations with um, the Agency of Agriculture's hemp program. And I think a lot of this still depends on a lot of things that we have in motion right now, depending on what our relationship potentially with the Agency of Agriculture is going to look like through an MOU or something similar to that, what kind of resources are going to be necessary at the pre-app phase when we understand how many cultivators tend to intend to actually enter this market. There's a lot of things that are going to need to be, um, I think, backfilled and determined how, especially my first bullet here, um, which may or not be, may or may not be random. We, we've heard from the hemp team at the Agency of Agriculture that they try and get to about one in six um, hemp cultivation facilities each year, and that's pretty much resource-based. They have one hemp inspector. There's a lot of cross-trained inspectors through water quality and some of their other inspection divisions, but from a resource perspective, it's hard to get every single um, site visited each calendar year. So I think, depending on a couple things, you know, I'd like to see more than that figure represented here when it comes to actual inspection to make sure we understand exactly what's happening, but there's just so much that we still need to figure out um, to kind of get to an understanding of if 100% of um, cultivation facilities can be got, you know, uh, looked at and kind of combed through um, each calendar year, or we're going to hit a ballpark range or some somewhere a little short of that 100%. Um, so the rest of this is pretty pretty um, you know standard as it relates to what to expect when any state agency might be coming um, to your place of business to to look at what's going on, inspect a, a cannabis product or cannabis infused product during processing or storage inspections. Sam can include sampling, taking uh, 
uh, photographs, video, talking to registrants or witnesses, and inspecting records, especially if this isn't random, but somebody has called us or, or a designee and said, hey, I think that there might be a problem or this person might be doing something outside the scope of their license, um, so on and so forth. Um, inspection may also include um, inspecting equipment and or vehicles used for growing, processing, transporting cannabis, cannabis products and or cannabis infused products. We've talked a lot about transportation security and what that looks like. Um, I think it's important that, that um, as we think about cultivation facility inspection, recognizing those times throughout um, the life cycle of this crop and how it's moving between um, cultivation and, and other parts of the supply chain. I included some, some language about um, using uh, cannabis crop samples to connect genetic testing and research. You know, our fail, the Vermont Ag and Environmental Lab has that um, capability to an extent. And as we look to gather how Vermont genetics start to take off once we kind of get a couple years under our belt, I think it'll be important for us to understand what works well given our, our climate, so on and so forth. You know, what's, what's working outdoor, what's working indoor. And, um, trying to make sure that we're continuing to do adequate research to the extent that we're able to. I think this is a big part of, of the state kind of being able to do that instead of relying strictly on private partners to do that for us. Any questions? Again, this is a baseline that I hope hope we can um, work out with, um, you know, the enforcement team at Ag and the inspection team at Ag or, you know, if, if that's a direction that we end up going in. And I have a little bit of similar, of similar yeah. kind of what an inspection may or may not include on my slides. So. Yeah, and again, I, I put like what it may or may not require um, to be defined through policy yeah. rather than rulemaking because I think, again, depending on how many, if it's a checklist that somebody's going through from an inspection, an inspector might be able to get to multiple sites per day, but if it's more involved than that, it's taking pictures, it's writing reports, it's doing, you know, and in each case could be very different. Right? You know, you might have a random inspection where somebody is hitting all their marks. You might have some that you know need to be improved upon a little bit from their from their cultivation practices or their record keeping, so on and so forth. So it's it's hard. I think we're we're just going to need to be need to be flexible there, recognizing that um, we're we're going to have a scattershot of of folks that are going to if somebody does show up randomly at your door, how prepared they are for that yeah. for that day and for that inspection. The collecting samples and so forth. Um, does that include samples of like the advertising that we've approved to ensure that it's compliant with what we've approved? I haven't okay. thought about that explicitly because I was thinking more in terms of the, of the cultivation end of mm -hmm. things more so than the retail, but if, if they are, and I mean this could change depending on how our program looks, if there are direct sales or somebody is pursuing a retail license to put you know, near their cultivation site. Um, you know, I, I think that's something that we can, if, if it's present, then that could certainly be sampled. Um, I was thinking more in terms of the, the crop itself yeah. in relation to this slide, but that, that makes sense depending on how somebody is promoting their product, if they are recognizing that they're the, you know, not knowing what their business relationship with other parts of the supply chain really looks like. But I, I would be open to including that just to yeah. give them the ability to do so. For cultivation, it's really more about the packaging. Yeah. Right. Okay, renewal, again, this is this is pretty basic. Some of this language is, is written in statute. Um, I'm proposing that we'll send a, a um, notice for renewal 120 days prior to the expiration of a license, so about uh, four months before your license is set uh, to expire, and that's because in statute, uh, renewal applications can be submitted up to 90 days prior to the expiration of a license. Some other states, um, in this, this sub bullet um, may apply for a renewal not less than 30 days prior to the license's expiration date and that kind of just provides us time to administratively look at your renewal application so that you're not submitting at 11.59 p.m. before your license does expire and then we need the time to actually fundamentally make sure that you can continue on with your license there. I did put some kind of backstops in there that if somebody doesn't get their license within 30 days to us a written explanation detailing circumstances surrounding the untimely filing, or if this happens and we just can't get you an answer before your license does um, expire, because I would expect that, you know, in addition to the bottleneck that happens 
that we've been talking about through priority stuff, if everybody's getting their license around the same time, they're all gonna expire around the same time and we're not gonna have the ability to really stagger out how we're doing this throughout the calendar year. Um, there's gonna be one time of the year where, where this is a, a bulk of what we're doing administratively. And if we can't get you that license, then allowing it to continue administratively until you either hear back from us one way or another. Any questions? I assume that we can automate a lot of these um, notices as well. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, if we have a licensing portal, presumably most people can get an email yeah, about you their know, license expiration. You know, I know my only hesitancy there coming from the, the ag world is some folks prefer a paper notice. Right. Um, chose to not make that decision right now like we can work out depending on what software we use if we need to send it to your email that's on file and a paper notice how we want to how we want to move in that direction um, I think we can develop over the once we kind of see what our software is capable of once we kind of get there but we don't we don't know yet but I know people are very fond of uh, you know a tangible notice when it comes to a lot of farmers that we likely we'll be working with. Yeah. This looks good. And this is just some um, some stuff I would like to see included in your renewal. Uh, oh. oh no. <laughs> Picture's falling. <laughs> it's past Halloween and we still got ghosts. Mm -hmm. Let's fall off my wall. <laughs> Um, so just stuff that should be included in your application renewal fee or your application renewal at the time that you submit, which is the uh, requisite licensing fee. We've talked about um, benchmark data for efficiency and water standards, and I've proposed that. And again, I want to make sure that data we're asking folks to collect is actually used. I think this can help us understand your impact to your environment and also understand that this market's impact to climate goals that the state is currently trying to achieve. Applicator reports, as part of our cultivation plan, it's, I talked about this a couple of meetings ago. Um, in that plan, if I recall correctly, we're kind of hopefully gonna ask you what you plan to use from a pesticide, fungicide, herbicide perspective as part of your operation. You might not end up doing everything that you think you're gonna do before you put plants in the ground, but that report from your last harvest or that last calendar year, what have you actually put in as part of your products? I think it's important that we know that and we can understand um, what's necessary to be a part of our market versus, you know, what, what are you using to kind of foster more growth? Yeah. All um, of the seed to sale tracking um, programs that I'm aware of allow cultivators to enter that in as they're doing it. Great, then it shouldn't be that hard for right. them to get yeah. to us. Changes to adjustments to an outdoor cultivation site, if any, through diagram and GIS coordinate information. And I, and I thought this was in, um, necessary from a couple certain perspectives when it comes to my environmental and agricultural background. Let's say you have a 2,500 2, square foot cultivation um, site. Because it's harder to crop rotate, because you're growing strictly cannabis, um, it might be appropriate for you to move that cultivation site within a designated part of your uh, the land that you're growing on. And I mean, there's other tax implications that we're working through, or I'm, I'm in communication with the tax department on, on what this would look like, how much land you can kind of take out of current use. But, you know, you might want to just move it, uh, you know, a couple hundred feet to the left or to the right, just to kind of recognize that if you keep depleting soil in a similar way over multiple cultivation, harvest, your soil is going to become less, less palpable when it comes to growing a high quality product. So if you do, if, if that applies to you and you plan on doing um, some tweaks to your operation from where it's specifically located, we need to know that. Even if it's plain to the eye, that GIS coordinate will change specifically. Um, I think you're going to recover some of my last remaining points in here, but I just thought it was necessary to talk about. Disclosure of any relevant changes to direct and or direct financial interest. We need to know um, if something's happening or you're planning on um, expanding your, your financial portfolio. 
um, in good standing with CCB enforcement or designee and other, other applicable state agencies where good standing is defined. And I know at the Agency of Agriculture, um, it's defined as no final order signed by a secretary of jurisdiction or no court order signed by a judge. And that kind of covers your administrative, civil, and criminal uh, perspective. And I think you're gonna talk more about good standing, but um, I think the 30,000 foot view is most people know if they're not <laughs> in good standing for one reason or another, um, you know, you can't seek grant opportunities if you're not in good standing with the water quality division, if you are a farm, so on and so forth, um, over over that, that department. But that's something that we're gonna need to coordinate. Um, folks will know, but this even kind of gets back to our, our tax discussion. If you have a plan to become tax compliant and you haven't followed up on any of that, um, that's something that we're gonna need to know and, and define at a later date to understand what good standing means and what efforts you've actually mm -hmm. taken to correct a wrong. This does mean that somebody could be working through the process and not receive the final order and still get their license re renewed though, and that's typically how things do, do function at the state level. And then what happens if they go, if we renew the license and then they still don't become compliant, does it does that have to get revoked? Is that what you're I've got talking some about? Of that okay. stuff in my I think sense. that was a good clean transition yeah. into what you're gonna <laughs> be talking about. So yeah. again, I only have three sides. I, I drew the lucky straw. I'm just gonna this take that thing off my wall. Yeah, I hope it doesn't come crashing down. <laughs> There. I think that's as far as it'll go. You can, I can control right? it from my computer. Okay. Fine. I'm gonna leave it like that because I have some notes up over here. Um, but uh, all right, so just gonna start with a continued discussion from last week about the integrated specific operational requirements, um, specifically around the, whether we're gonna require separate inventories and, and if not, how we're gonna handle transfers between the two. Um, and then on the enforcement end of things, um, the criteria that we might use to deny an initial application, what we might do to either suspend, revoke, um, impose a fine, or deny a renewal application um, in the process there, and then the appellate process. So starting, oops. Um, so again, this is kind of uh, that language at the top, it's from uh, Act 164, um, and it's the provision that allows the transfer uh, between medical and the integrated license. And you know, I think again, just as a way of kind of level setting, I, I think this provision was included to ensure that we don't see a supply shortage um, when these first retail sales begin, and there's no other cultivators uh, with plants in the ground. Um, other than the existing medical dispensaries. So um, I really think that we need to look at this kind of as a temporary provision. Uh, it's a bridge policy. Um, but even if we consider it that way, I think we stu still need to maintain some control over these transfers because the two concerns that I raised last week still exist, which are there might be, if there's a full transfer of the entire medical supply to the adult use, then there might be nothing left for the patients that rely on that supply. Um, and then also, um, you know, we don't want to entrench kind of some in inequitable advantage to these three companies um, that's not allowed with other companies. So um, I think uh, I can't really see a good reason to have a segregated medical and adult use inventory at the cultivation stage. I think it's an unnecessary and somewhat burdensome um, thing that actually is a detriment to patients because if you have a segregated medical, um, you know, they're, they're not going to, the medical patients aren't going to have access to whatever the kind of variety of strains that are being allowed to be grown on the, not allowed to be grown, but will be grown on the adult use size with that larger canopy. So I think that there's actually a a reason to not segregate them. Um, 
So that's just kind of the first point. The second point, um, you know, we're talking about point of access for medical patients, um, whether they need to have a separate entrance. Um, you know, I'm fine with requiring a separate entrance. I think what I really want to see, though, is that if a medical patient shows up and there's a line around the block that they get to be, they get priority entrance, they get to go right in, they get to pick up their supplies, and that could be either through a reservation process, which they currently have, but I don't think it would be required. But if they want to reserve a spot, the medical dispensaries are required to honor that reservation. Um, we could allow for curbside sales. I mean, that's what's allowed right now. Um, so I think just continuing that process for medical patients so they don't have to stand in line um, if there is one. Um, and then um, maintaining inventory records, I think from the prior year um, that let put everyone on notice as to what products they need to maintain. It doesn't have to be a full year's supply of those products. I, you know, I think what the dispensaries have suggested is that it's actually better to just kind of keep three months supply because they can change dramatically from quarter to quarter. And if they keep enough for three months and they see upticks, then um, they can, you know, they'll know that they need to keep at least that kind of three month supply, whatever was sold in the prior three months on hand for the medical patients. And then um, kind of where I landed on the transfer um, is, so we have the largest cultivation tier that's available to all Vermonters. Whatever that largest cultivation tier would apply um, to the dispensaries. And if they're gonna transfer anything above that, um, as in like if the largest tier is 25,000, we have some equivalent poundage wise, like 25,000 equals, you know, 100,000 pounds of cannabis. I know that's probably not accurate, um, but uh, that any transfer that would be above that so above what everyone else is playing at would require our approval. Is this for the one, the, the one time transfer this coming spring or you mean transferring no. at their discretion at any time? They can transfer at their discretion so long as they main, maintain three months supply for the medical and so long as if they're transferring above whatever our largest cultivation tier is that they get board approval. Is that what's available? Like so we're holding the 25,000 tier initially and only starting with 15,000? Are we talking about what we've assigned a fee to or what we're actually? I would say whatever's available to everyone okay. at that time. If we haven't opened the 25,000 okay. and we've only opened the 15, then they're capped at the 15. Okay. Do I understand correctly? So the medical and adult use are licensed separately, right? right? And right now in the legislation, the, the caps on what they can cultivate are, are different. Like we've talked about square footage and then and the medical side it's like number plant of plants. plants. Yeah. yeah. So I think what I'm worried about is how do we keep track of how much is in the adult use market versus the medical market making sure we're meeting demand on both sides if they measure them differently. Well so at, in on February all plant counts go away. Okay. So like all of the on the medical side uh, so that allows them to grow in anticipation of, right. Right, of sales. Anymore. But then they're still licensed differently, right? So they would still, they're, like the medical side would have a medical license, right? right? And the adult use side would have an integrated license. Right. But we're going to allow them to cultivate the same. They would essentially be cultivating the entirely on the medical side. And, and then transferring. And then transferring a certain percentage of their pro product to the adult use retail side. The so they side. need to maintain that minimum know amount for the medical based upon the kind of last year based upon the last year's inventory and the pre preceding three months um, sales that they've actually made and then um, anything else they could transfer to the adult use size but they would be capped at whatever the highest tier is available at that time and then if they need to go above that because there is this supply shock or so mm -hmm. supply shortage that they could apply to the board to have a transfer over and above what other people are entitled to. And again, this would be until this provision, you know, goes away and we have other cultivators out there and we have other retailers that can um, kind of supply that, that can meet that supply demand or that demand. 
So from your perspective, when does this provision go away? Well, it, it, it ha there's no end date yet. I would say that we have that transfer approval requirement until it does. So as long as this provision is in effect, um, you know, they're capped at the highest license type. I'm just trying to figure out in my head if let's say that they can, they transfer 15,000 square feet of canopy and once they receive their license in April, can they, when's the next time they can transfer 15,000 square feet of canopy? And that would, if they do that in April, then any other transfer would, would require our approval. And they couldn't do it because they need to maintain the medical supply. So they couldn't do the entire inventory that they have. Right, okay. I just didn't want this unlimited transfer to exist beyond the initial you know, kickstart phase, even if they were transferring 10,000 square feet of canopy into the retail side of things. Right. This, this is, the transfer is essentially a pressure release valve for us that we get to control above a certain level. I think maybe what we could also do is develop some type of test or legal test for if we are hitting the need to, like an emergency, bring in a lot more supply. What X, Y, and Z need to be done and shown by us and by one of these integrated license holders to actually, you know, provide that type of supply into the retail market. So yeah. some structure behind that last bullet. Yeah, I'm just right. thinking about future boards who might feel differently about this type of transfer. Mm -hmm. I, I get, I, I get how this is going to go away once the provision is no longer. But for those emergency situations for future boards, mm -hmm. you know, what's the test to determine other than their discretion? that this can't be satisfied by other parts of the market and other license holders? Well, it's in our discretion, um, but we need to figure out some criteria around that discretion. Right. And the three-month piece, that's that doesn't go away. That is part of this ongoing plan, right? That's, that's, the, that's the ongoing commitment, yeah. yeah. And I, getting back to your first point, I know I kind of pounded the table to kind of want to understand <laughs> the, the physical separation of the two last Friday and, and after talking with some folks and understanding the software capabilities a little bit more I'm, and the recognition that the medical side of this needs to be treated from a, a cultivation perspective equally if not paid more attention to than the adult use side, I'm uncomfortable with them, um, you know, not segregating at the cultivation stage. stage. So how will we know how, when you're saying that they'll cultivate pretty much entirely on the medical side? then transfer for other parts of yeah. their license. Yeah, so like those plant counts disappear, I think, what, in February? Right. Yeah, and then they can start growing in anticipation of a license that they're gonna receive in April so that there's an adequate supply when retail hits. But I think what, what Pepper's saying is they need to still have a plan to maintain the continuity of the medical program when that does hit. Right, yeah, I get that. I just don't under, if they're, always cultivating on the medical side like how will we ever know how much is could go into because they can anything above the largest cultivation tier would require board approval but anything below that would not so we would have to just kind of make a determination as to what the equivalent poundage of like weight of um, kind of harvested cannabis would be equivalent to the largest cultivation tier, and then we'd have to just track any movement, and then anything that gets above that weight would require our approval. Those plant counts go away, but we need to, we're gonna be working on the medical regulations next year once I, right? right. Since it's, it's once we actually inherit the program, and so I think we need to figure out that end of things so they aren't growing X, Y, Z amount in the medical side, hoping that they could potentially transfer it at some point in time. Right, but I think what you're both saying is if it's above a certain amount, it requires our approval, but right. below that does not. So well, how would we ever not. really know what's in cultivation for the adult use market if we're... Well, we'll, we'll have some sort of understanding of every licensees, regardless of whether they're integrated medical or not, um, what they're growing. I mean, whether it's, you know, seed to sale track, some form of seed to sale tracking. Right. So. so we'll know the entire canopy and we'll be inspecting as well right 
So we'll know what the entire medical canopy is. And all we're saying here is you play by the same rules as everyone else. And if there is some pressing need because of supply shortages, you know, the board is willing to consider a transfer over and above what other people are allowed to cultivate. But they wouldn't, and just so I understand your last bullet, I know I've asked this like eight different ways at this point. <laughs> so they could potentially transfer up to 15,000 square feet of canopy or the, the, the translatable poundage, right. whatever. And I don't know that off the top of my head. Initially, for a startup, but any transfers after that would have to be approved by us. So if they're hitting their cap, which would be the same cap that would apply to any other right. cultivator, um, in their initial transfer, then yes, any transfer beyond that would require our approval. Just uh, we want to keep in mind that they can't actually transfer their entire supply because they need to maintain three months supply for the medical fields. Well, let's but say I'm if they did it in the first, you know, three months. You know, they did like all but you know 10% of their supply went over to the adult rack, um, and then they did another 10% of their supply the next month. And any transfer beyond that would have to be approved. Okay, I think I understand. <laughs> so they could transfer like 10,000 square feet of canopy initially, and then another 5,000 in a couple months without our approval. But if they hit over 15,000 in aggregate, they need to get our approval. Right, which would be consistent with any other licensee. I'm trying to hold them to the same standard that we would hold any other yep. person with an approved 15,000 square foot. Yeah. Well, except except that no other licensee can grow and transfer, right? So it's not really the same standard. Well, this is a temporary provision that's yeah. so designed to meet the initial demand when no other, no other license, license cultivator has any supply because they put their seeds in the ground on April 1st or May 1st. Um, and so they, like no one has a legal can't like a legal plant to sell. Mm -hmm. Only these people do. I understand that. Yeah. Right. Any further discussion on, on this? This is where I've landed. We can continue the discussion after public comment, but this is kind of where I think it strikes the balance between recognizing what the purpose of this provision is, but also putting some guardrails on it. Yeah, I think it makes sense to have them be able to transfer up to our, our highest tier in anticipation of the market, but anything after that, we need to know and we need to say yes or no. I think is what you have written here. I just wanted to make sure I understood while provision is in effect meant in, in relation to how you are approaching this. Yeah. I think we're on the same page. Okay. It's tough because we're talking about canopy, but then the transfer is going to be of, yeah. you know, flower. Is it finished pieces. product that they're trying? It's not. We'd have to figure that out. I, I, what it would be it would be hold people to the same standard, hold, hold the integrated licenses to the same standard of whatever we have in on the non-integrated license Because I think that's tiers. my question, right? Because you could cultivate 15,000 square feet of canopy and they could be almost grown plants, then you could transfer them to your integrated license and then start over, and they would effectively in one year potentially get 30,000 square feet of canopy, right? Unless we said that you can only transfer at the point at which this product is then gonna go to processing right. retail. Yeah. I think we can get prescriptive on that. Yeah, I think that's what I was worried about. I do mention the cultivation stage. So when it's moving out of cultivation into product manufacturing, that I feel like that's where the kind of transfer would happen. Yeah, you can't just like propagate and then transfer it and right. then grow it. Right. All right. So moving on to the enforcement side of things, I'm starting with just how the criteria we might use to deny in an initial application, which I think might be different than what we would use to deny a renewal. Um, so, so essentially, um, what I have here is, you know, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Colorado, they all have pretty much the same standard for denial of an initial application. It's very kind of black and white and non-discretionary. Um, uh, I know like what we, how we use criminal history records and things like that is discretionary, but essentially if you fail that, 
if you fail whatever you know threshold we have on criminal history disqualifiers, then your application is denied. If you can't meet the ownership requirements, um, and that's the kind of one one license per entity, um, including the financiers, um, those requirements. If you've made false misleading statements or if you omitted um, a material fact, um, if you've demonstrated a danger to public health, safety, or general welfare, um, and that really includes a history of distributing to minors, um, involvement with organized crime, diverting um, you know, cannabis to other states, and then um, engaging in trafficking of controlled substances or using firearms in your cannabis business. And then I just, uh, so that's kind of the, the main criteria. I added the one at the bottom, uh, which is has not met the minimum standards um, of that kind of priority of licensure conversation that we just had, whatever minimum standards we create for those 903 criteria. So to me, this is kind of like, you know, there's not a lot of discretion, that, which really makes things easier for us uh, when it comes to kind of when people object or kind of appeal our decision on a denial of an application. You know, these are very objective criteria. They're kind of on off switches. You either meet them or you don't. Um, so I think that's pretty straightforward. So suspension, revocation, denial um, of a renewal, these are kind of a little bit more complicated issues. Um, these are the statutory provisions that exist in from Act 164 that give us the authority to suspend, revoke, or impose uh, other enforcement actions. Um, you know, we just have the general authority to do it. Um, the, we can require the commissioner of taxes to um, revoke a license, a tax license. Um, we can, um, local commissions, you mentioned this earlier, can revoke uh, or suspend a license for violations of the kind of local ordinances. And then um, the board may assess civil penalties um, to people that are um, dispensing to under 21 uh, folks. So just wanted to just put up the statutory authority. Um, so Massachusetts, uh, this is kind of their permissive authority to enforce. Um, you know, they require all licensees to be in, in compliance with their regulations. And, you know, the submission of a license is um, you kind of agreeing or consenting to the following types of inspections. And Kyle touched on a lot of these already. But announced or unannounced inspections, um, investigations related to complaints, financial audits, um, the secret, secret shopper program, I think that's really just like making sure people are checking IDs and not, not distributing um, to people under 21 years old. And then just kind of a catch-all provision. And then the things that they're, um, the, board, the commission in Massachusetts is allowed to do are kind of immediate access to a facility. Um, you know, they can demand records. Um, they can inspect, um, you know, demand kind of, you know, the, all the things that you would need to do an audit and for an inspection. Um, these are the um, types of things that trigger enforcement actions in Massachusetts, and I would suggest that we um, adopt this. I've modified it um, basically a little bit just to use the language in our, in our statutes. Um, but any violation of laws, um, including you know, tax noncompliance and dispensing to youth, um, and again, this wouldn't necessarily trigger a suspension, revocation, or denial, but it would trigger some sort of enforcement action that could include suspension, revocation, or denial. Um, any action implicating risk to public safety, health, or welfare, um, false or misleading information to the board, um, failure to cooperate in an investigation, or to submit a corrective action plan, or to pay fines. I'll talk about the corrective action plans a little bit later. Um, changed ownership or assigned its license to another without prior approval of the board, um, failed to comply with the control limitations, that would be um, the kind of one license per entity rule. Um, the, um, just 
the lack of responsible operation, just sanitary concerns, um, non-compliance with the diversity plan, so that's specific to Massachusetts. You know, you can see you can have enforcement actions if people promise, you know, the, the sky in their application and they don't follow through with it. Um, sales to minors, um, and then just kind of other incompetent or negligent operations. Um, substandard level of compliance um, with statutory or regulatory requirements in another jurisdiction. So if you have, you know, enforcement actions against you in another state where you're operating, that could um, lead to a potential enforcement action here in Vermont. Um, just any conduct or practices that have been that have been deemed detrimental to the safety, health, and welfare of the public. Because um, you know you could see how someone might be in the midst of some enforcement action for water quality standards or something, and we might want to, you know, potentially suspend a license because of that activity, but it hasn't led to a final order yet. Um, and then just any other ground that serves the purposes of Act 64 or 62. I'd say this is a non-exhaustive list, but this is kind of, this is built on um, Massachusetts. Um, I guess the non-exhaustive is covered in any other ground. has attempted to change ownership or assign its license to another entity without prior approval of the board. So that kind of, as written, kind of makes it sound like we help decide if somebody's going to sell to an out-of-state or change ownership. I is that, I just want to make sure I understand how yeah, that one's written. I think that would really be... Um, if they do it without telling. If like they do it without know. letting us know. I mean, I don't, I don't think that we... Really, I don't know if we have the authority to be like, you can't so do this, this. Yeah. but we can I don't know David, I don't know David I'm kind of looking at you I mean <clears throat> any licensee has to meet the requirements of the board and you guys have to be able to check and ensure that that happens right so I don't think that a licensee has the ability to freely transfer without the subsequent ownership group being uh, vetted by this board and uh, being approved for a license I, I agree with that just wanted to make sure I yeah. understood this and what our role would be in that situation yeah, I don't know enough about ownership or beneficiary ownership to really answer that question. You know, I know some of these companies are publicly traded companies, so, but I do think that, you know, we have the 10% rule, and I think DFR could help us understand it's that it's going to be. And, yeah, and just to add to be clear, they could certainly sell the business. Yeah. The question is whether the new ownership has a license to operate. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's, I guess, where my... Yeah, so the business, you know, that's that's their that's their private, you know, interest. They can do what they want, but they may need to come and seek a new license. The subsequent owner of the group has to meet the requirements of the board, and you determine whether they've done so. That makes a lot of sense. The way that's phrased. So thanks. Also, just by statute, you always have to know who the, who is controlling. Right. The entity that you're associated. Yeah. No. ourselves into every business decision that's going on at a certain level, recognizing that they're needed, they might still need to come and seek a new license from yeah. us if they do do certain things, but we're not a market dynamic, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I understand, I understand those two, I just wanted to make sure I understood this. Um, so here are some examples of enforcement actions for non-compliance. Um, that Massachusetts has, and they are very clear that this is a non-exhaustive list, um, but these are just throwing it out there as things that I think we also have the authority to do. Um, so just holds on products, limitation on sales, removal, the prohibition of products, quarantine, cease and desist orders, suspension orders, show cause orders. So if you're about to take an action, you can ask them, you can ask a company to say, we think that you violated this law, we have evidence, show us why you haven't. Um, uh, suspension of a license, revocation, denial of a renewal, um, or avoiding a license. Just figured I'd throw that out there, just kind of, it's helpful background. Mm -hmm. So I had a long conversation with Dave Huber at the Agency of Agriculture 
I thought it would be important to include some information about the Agency of Agriculture's enforcement structure because it's one that a lot of our cultivators are used to. Um, you know, he's been in, it's been in place for at least the last six years while he's been there, and um, it's been approved by the Attorney General's office. It's the same, it's r roughly identical to, it's similar to what ANR uses. And so there's a certain amount of kind of consistency that I think we want to have with and our, or agency of ag. Um, so I figured I'd just walk through it a little bit. So this is the statutory um, or the uh, rulemaking authority or the regulatory authority that um, we have. You can really see that it's an education first approach and trying to help people come into compliance as opposed to being punitive. Um, it's all about taking, identifying and taking corrective action and working with the alleged violator to um, deal with the issues that are being um, brought forward, either by a complaint or through an investigation. Um, so here's kind of the corrective action plan that I kind of talked about a little bit. Uh, there's, um, you know, 10 days after you've received the letter to kind of ha propose a corrective action plan or correct the violation. And then Dave Huber really, you know, his phone number is plastered all over the website, all over all these forms, and he will go and work with you um, to kind of really take corrective action. Um, you can see though that there is kind of these graduated sanctions um, for people that um, are being negligent, repeatedly negligent, people that kind of rack up violations. Um, or if you're acting intentionally, willfully, or knowingly, if you kind of have a kind of specific intent to violate, um, that there's ratcheted up enforcement capabilities. Um, so this goes beyond just kind of the education first. It's kind of like people who have demonstrated an inability to kind of take corrective action. So what does this look like in practice? Um, this again is based on my conversation with Dave. So typically, um, there's a complaint received, and I apologize if you guys have covered this no. extensively in the compliance and enforcement subcommittee. But we haven't. So there's a complaint received either from someone who's doing an inspection, or they have, uh, you know, again, Dave's cell phone is plastered all over the, you know, Agency of Agriculture's website, his email. You know, he's open 24/7 to receiving these complaints. They have a very good anonymous online portal um, that is very kind of easy to use, user-friendly if you want to submit a complaint that way. Um, depending on the severity of the complaint, um, Dave will send an investigator uh, within 24 to 48 hours, generally speaking, um, and the investigator will generate a report that either confirms or denies that the violation occurred, and it will be reviewed by the chief policy enforcement officer, which is Dave. Um, and then the actions that they take, kind of from an early standpoint, depending on you know the nature of the complaint, is the kind of lowest form of response is a letter of warning. This is sent through certified mail. It includes a statement of the facts. There's no response that's required, and there's no follow-up investigation. But it does become part of your licensee's permanent record. Um, the next level up is a corrective action letter, um, and this does require um, a response within 10 days of receipt and it's sent through certified mail. Um, um, you need to kind of admit to the action um, and then provide, or the violation, and then provide evidence of a corrective action. Um, and you can also, if it's a more kind of long-term corrective action that's needed, you can kind of just present a reasonable plan to actually correct it. And Dave can kind of help people through what, what's a reasonable plan and what's not. Um, and then these always require um, a follow-up inspection and a case closure letter. So, you know, people can submit their plan, but then it has to be verified um, by the agency. Um, the next level up is kind of a notification of violation. Um, this includes a administrative penalty. Um, there's a form, again, it's been approved, it's the same one that ANR uses, and it's been approved by the agency, or the Attorney General. It's a very um, kind of non-discretionary uh, kind of, basically, it, sets, it allows you to calculate the appropriate fine based upon the severity of the offense, but you're allowed to consider aggravating or mitigating circumstances, 
and kind of the financial hardship of the license holder. So you can adjust the penalty downwards based upon the financial hardship. Um, and uh, it again requires, in addition to the fine, it requires a corrective action plan and follow-up inspections. Now, so people can appeal those decisions, those notices as a violation. Um, you know, the way that they do things, I think, is going to be slightly different than how we do things here um, because our statutes are, are different, um, but, and we have different considerations than they do. But for them, um, you know, from the date you receive the letter, you have 15 days to request an appeal. Uh, if you request one, if you don't request one, then you waive your appellate rights um, and you kind of admit to the factual basis of the letter. Um, the agency, if you do request one, the agency will appoint a hearing officer. Um, the standard that the hearing officer is reviewing is to see if the action taken by the agency was arbitrary and capricious. Um, the judgment, if, if, the, if the agency finds, if the hearing officer finds in favor of the agency, as in the action was not arbitrary and capricious, they still have the ability to adjust the penalty. Um, or waive it altogether um, if they think the corrective action plan, um, you know, is sufficient. And then from the date of that judgment, you have 30 days to request an appeal to the Superior Court. And the Superior Court will, I think, I didn't, I didn't, I think they're gonna just base their review on the record that was created during this process. There is also the ability to have settlement conferences prior to the hearing, and you know, Dave said, the vast majority of these, like 99%, um, get dealt with in a settlement conference. So that's that's the Agency of Agriculture's process. Sounds pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. So for our process, I would say the initial kind of stages, the education first, the kind of corrective action letters um, would hold true for us you know, really have an education first approach for um, kind of non-intentional uh, violations, you know, or non-repeated violations. I think we would need a kind of different process for um, uh, more serious threats to public safety. So um, I would say that, so certain enforcement actions need to happen immediately, like stop sales or um, kind of, you know, if there's a serious or immediate threat that we need to mitigate to public health, safety, or welfare, that we could take an immediate and kind of an emergency enforcement action. Um, but if we don't go that way, uh, if we don't need to do that, if, if, there's, if there's no kind of like ongoing immediate or serious threat to public health, then we need to have a process before we actually impose a, some kind of suspension or relocation of a license. So um, I think we would do some, similar to the kind of notice of violation um, that the agency of ag sends out. We would do a notice of action letter. It could be called a notice of violation letter um, to the alleged violator prior to taking an enforcement action that details a lot of the same stuff and it could be the exact same form that ag uses if we wanted to adapt it or adopt it. Um, it details the alleged violation, it creates the factual basis, it would include the kind of investigation report um, that you know was signed off on, um, and it would detail the scope of the enforcement action that we're taking, and then it would allow, um, it would just notify the licensee of their right to contest the allegations, and if required, um, uh, request a hearing. And I don't think we need to have a hearing for everything, um, there's certain types of enforcement actions that I don't think actually require us to hold a hearing, um, but they could, at a minimum in every case, contest in writing within 15 days. Um, so uh, the licensee's response um, shall specifically identify each issue and fact and dispute and state um, the position of the licensee, um, as well as include the kind of pertinent facts, the evidence um, that, that could be adduced at a hearing if or that they have kind of support for. Um, and then um, failure to respond within the 15-day window uh, constitutes an admission to the factual basis and a waiver of future appellate rights to challenge the enforcement action. Um, 
and then if we get one of these letters requesting um, or if we get a letter or a written response contesting the enforcement action then we can hold a hearing if required and again certain actions that we take will require a hearing but certain won't and I don't need to kind of detail them here but cer certain actions do require a hearing um, and um, and just we'll have a hearing that will be then we'll kind of follow the kind of hearing officer procedures you know there'll be a standard arbitrary and capricious usually about what the hearing officer is looking at our action and then just the imposition of the enforcement action shall be deemed a final decision of the board which is important for the next stage of the appellate process any questions about this though it's essentially a modified version of what ag does and it's more specific to our our specific jurisdiction so the appeals um, this is from act 164 I just wanted to let everyone see the statutory language um, and so the reason why we need that kind of initial step to build the record is because this appeal is based upon the record that was created by the board so there's no ability for this appellate officer which is um, contemplated um, to actually take evidence additional evidence mm -hmm. so we need to have a process to get kind of all the evidence on the record at the board level um, and so then the appellate officer um, can so they're not allowed to substitute the kind of how we interpreted the evidence um, on the questions of fact but if they and so they can affirm just based on the record or they can um, reverse and remand the matter if they're if they if the substantial right has been implicated and it's been implicated because of you know some some criteria that uh, that's listed out there one through seven and then once again um, that decision of the appellate officer um, can be appealed directly to the Supreme Court. Um, and I assume that that would just follow the kind of rules of appellate procedure. I think it's usually 30 days from the final judgment um, is your appeal window. Uh, I think there's certain c circumstances where it might be 15. Um, I don't know where we fall in on there, but, I, but um, and then again, the Supreme Court can only use the record that was created at the board process, which is why it's pretty essential that we have that process for um, kind of objecting to these notices of violations. So who could be there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess this is just kind of uh, summarizes where um, I think that we wind up on the appellate process after we have a final action by the board. So again, when we have a um, you know certain things will be considered a final dis decision of the board certain enforcement actions will be a final decision which triggers the appellate appeals window and then if we receive a hearing request um, it goes directly to the executive director the um, executive director has 30 days or, or sorry the, the in a timely manner the executive director appoints a um, appellate officer um, and then they're subject to the criteria on the prior two slides. Um, and then, right, it, it just, it, this, this slide just summarizes the process that I have laid out. So on the appeal side, you know, any affirmed decision may be appealed to the Supreme Court under the Vermont Rules of Appellate Procedure. So that's it on the enforcement side of things um, from a procedural standpoint. Any questions on any of that or discussion? I don't think so. Sounds good. David, am I uh, out of line on any of that? I don't think so. <laughs> no? I, yeah. I mean, I really do think that, you know, the more that we can kind of rely on processes that have been developed by our partner agencies, including the Agency of Agriculture, um, the less of a shock any of this will be to current cultivators in the state mm -hmm. you know they're already subject to a lot of these I mean this is almost a 
carbon copy of what ag does. And that's not just for hemp per se, that's for right. any other business Water quality, regulated. pesticides. Yep. Yeah. Okay, um, that's the end of my slides for today. Um, it's 1226. I say, um, if we're all okay with it, maybe we move to public comment and we can have public comment and then have one last consideration of, of, of these slides and then we can um, vote on them. So anyone who would like to, well, why don't we start with people in the room who made the trip. Do you wanna make a public comment? Yes. Okay, please. Morning or good afternoon. It's like 26 minutes. Um, so uh, I'll try to speak. I sound cool. Uh, my name is Jen Daniels, and I reside in Colchester. Um, I own a hemp production company based in St. Albans um, uh, that farms in Irisburg and partners with Biothic Farms in Vermont, Michigan, and California. Um, and I'd like to offer comment deriving from my company's three years of experience with building capacity in the hemp value chain and uh, my 20 years of ex professional experience in community development and social equity. Um, so my basic point is I would like, or we, um, would like the final regs to have maximum benefit for building an equitable, diverse, and resilient value chain for cannabis in Vermont by establishing a framework for grower cooperatives to exchange, engage in the adult use program. Co-ops are an ideal way to secure the interest of growers and small businesses. I think Vermont's program is well on its way to becoming a national model for small growers and businesses to thrive, particularly given that no more than one license, thank you, will be issued to a given company within the same segment of the program. Nevertheless, the cannabis market is flooded with capital that is all too likely to find a way to dominate whatever the regs may provide. Therefore, true co-ops are the best way to ensure that small growers and businesses uh, like my own can compete by establishing a price structure that works for them. Through the legislation, though the legislation may not explicitly provide for co-ops, I believe there may be a way to establish such a framework through rulemaking by incorporating co-ops in the wholesale license. In fact, it probably makes sense to issue wholesale licenses only to co-ops since Vermont's program is happily aimed at promoting diverse and dispersed retail with no retail chains. Wholesaler businesses will likely struggle to provide wholesaling services in cost-effective manner. By contrast, entrusting wholesaling to co-ops will level leverage the interpersonal relationships that exist within Vermont's cannabis community throughout the state. Wholesale distribution will be more organic local and farm focused, elevating Vermont's craft brand for the 13 million visitors each year, many of whom seek out such truly craft Vermont products when they come to recreate and enjoy their second homes. As we all know, co-ops are an intrinsic part of Vermont's brand in agriculture. And then finally, um, and perhaps most importantly, limiting wholesaling to co-ops will result in the profits of wholesaling reverting back for the benefit of co-ops and their members, supporting their long-term viability and growth rather than flowing to intermediaries and brokers who have no means and frequently no desire to actually build capacity in the value chain. Thank you for Thanks, the opportunity. Jen. Thank you. Okay, um, so continuing to people who have joined uh, via the link, um, if you could raise your virtual hand if you'd like to make a public comment, and I see a hand raised. Uh, THC and Willux Laboratories first. THC Analytics Laboratory, if you'd like to make a comment, please feel free to unmute yourself. Hello, um, my name is Irene Plantillas, and I, I just have a comment about, on your equity program. Uh, it, it leaves me, uh, feeling unfair 
uh, uh, because uh, I feel like as he leaves out uh, the Hispanic and Native American communities. Uh, it's a lot of talk about back to black communities, which yes, they have been uh, discriminated, but uh, you're leaving out uh, several communities that have been discriminated just as bad uh, in the language. Um, so that is just my two cents on that. And I feel that it's uh, imperative that you guys, if you are going to look equitable, that you, that you uh, include these uh, cultures within your equity, equity program. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, Nelly? Yeah. Uh, next, we have Paul Shannon. Paul, you'd like to unmute? Just did. Great. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to second the proposal for co-ops. I believe I've raised the issue before. Here in the kingdom, there isn't an awful lot of money to start up a lot of things. But uh, a personal patch in the backyard, a lot of people have a lot of land. Um, but I'm disturbed by the idea that it would be restricted simply to wholesale. Um, the jump in profitability, if a co-op operated a dispensary, would much better serve the cooperative's members. Uh, they'd be able to get uh, a more equitable piece of the pie. Um, the way capitalism is, is set up, wholesale is good, uh, depending upon how much product you produce, um, the levels of scale. Uh, when you get into retail, um, keeping it on the shelves would be a lot easier uh, in a cooperative sense. Uh, not only that, but uh, people have their favorites. There would be a wider variety of strains that were available, especially, I mean, I, if there was to be a co-op, I'd like to have an idea as to um, if there would be any limit on numbers, you know. Uh, it's, it's wide, very diverse up here. Um, Quite frankly, there's a whole bunch of 1960 and 70 hippies up here. They've been growing pot for years. And uh, they'd love to be able to get in. They don't want to have the, uh, the upfront investment uh, in order to open a dispensary. But if they pooled the cash as a cooperative, it would be a whole lot better off. Um, and uh, if I understand the integrated license correctly, uh, it, would, it would or it would not um, include the ability to have a lab. Uh, but the cooperative, I think, is, is essential to the success of the, the emerging cannabis business in the kingdom. Um, and again, uh, putting a wholesale limit on it would, would I, I just think that it would hurt the cooperative's members. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me today. Have a good day. Thanks, Paul. Uh, next is Tito Byrne. Tito? Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, first, I'd just like to um, uh, build on what we were talking about last week about uh, deli style, uh, the deli style way of, of uh, selling cannabis retail. And I just want to point out that we've actually been doing this in the burn gallery now for over a year with our CBD flower, and it works really, really well. Um, from a sustainability perspective and also a cost perspective for um, small businesses entering this, um, um, having to prepare all your cannabis in little jars, I mean, the, the expense that's going to add is tremendous. And then all those jars are just, are just garbage. Um, and, um, and, and I'm starting to see that too. Um, I've, I've, you know, when I get uh, a jar from this dispensary or that dispensary and people are showing me, and I have a little collection of jars already building up and, and you know, it's all just trash. When a, uh, when a customer can come back, bring their jar, maybe get a discount, um, it, it, all feels, it all feels really nice and it feels right. Um, uh, second, I wanted to comment on the second door for um, medicinal patients. I definitely do not like that idea. Um, that could add tremendous building expenses. And in some cases, it's just actually impossible. Uh, so, um, you know, just in an effort to keep everybody involved, um, I think that could be a real barrier. Um, thank you all so much. Thanks, Tito. Uh, next is Sean LaRock. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd just like to note that I am definitely in support of detaching uh, individuals' identifications to a business. 
myself being a freelancer in numerous other industries, my credentials stay with me rather than an employee or a client. Uh, also in support of co-ops of somebody like myself being able to be a member of a co-op and not just be an employee, but be able to branch into fields such as like solventless separations or any number of boutique or craft areas that aren't necessarily represented uh, outside of some big facility and big company and big money kind of thing. That's it. Thank you so much All for right. your time. Thank you. Uh, next is Amelia. Hi guys. Um, I just wanted to kind of piggyback off what Tito said. Uh, he makes a really good point in terms of building costs. My other thought was that if somebody is renting a commercial property for their retail establishment, maybe they don't have the the right really to build and add another entrance. Jesse Lim brought up last week that if we require that the main entrance be ADA accessible, um, that is a lot easier on patients if people don't wanna add a second entrance. My other thought is that we're already going to have some form of security at the door checking IDs to make sure that everybody in these establishments is of age and if we can also just ensure that that person um, can kind of differentiate between an adult use patient and a medical patient, that's a way to make sure that medical patients are still getting priority in the retail spaces um, without necessarily having to add a separate doorway. Um, if there's just somebody there checking IDs and somebody to talk to to say, hey, I'm a medical patient, as opposed to, hey, I'm a rec user, an adult use user, that's kind of how you can ensure that the medical patients are still getting priority there. Thanks, Amelia. Uh, next is Joshua T. Crow. Joshua, feel free to unmute. Hey, how's it going? Thank you guys for allowing me to talk. So I, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Awesome. So I recently sent an email out. I'm not sure if you guys have seen it or not. However, my concern is personally, I mean, I've been a citizen in Vermont my whole life and the medicinal side has been always a factor for what I'm trying to accomplish with the genetics company and, and trying to get in there. However, the main difficult thing that I'm trying to accept is that there's no grants or, or programs for anybody like myself, unless you're a minority. Um, is there any is there anything in discussion that I've missed or anything that is coming into play for someone like myself that is trying to make a difference in this but is financially paycheck to paycheck with his wife you know and supporting his family so I feel like getting into the in, into it is going to be the most difficult thing for someone like me which there should be probably a lot of people like me that can't legally get into it because of finances without that little help in the beginning. Right. Um, I think that's basically all I have for now. Um, I mean, I, I do appreciate everything you guys are doing, but I'm just, that's one thing I want to see if there's any talk about or anything potential in your future. I thank you so much. Thank you. So I see THC analytics up again. Um, if you'd like to submit a comment through our public web portal, please do. Uh, I don't want to just kind of have people comment multiple times um, during this period. We do have one other person that right. just raised their hand as well. Yeah. Uh, so it's Ann Gilbert. Ann, if you'd like to unmute. Great. Um, thank you. Um, I'm the director of Central Vermont New Directions Coalition. We work on youth substance use prevention in Washington County, but um, I work with the other preventionists around, around the state. One of the things we do is we, we really partner with Department of Liquor Control in their education series for all employees of, um, you know, in retail establishments. And um, I just want to say, I think it'd be really important for all employees to really understand the public health and the public safety aspects of and the responsibilities of selling cannabis and especially around uh, to minors. There's also, you know, the compliance checks around alcohol, um, and around uh, cannabis in some other states and selling to minors um, is sometimes a, a fine or a suspension and I'm not sure what it would be in Vermont but I do think there should be a, a, a consequence um, so that we can really keep it out of the, um, the hands of kids if that's um, 
are, you know, such a main concern. And um, um, I, I'm concerned about the enforcement um, all around, and not only for those licensed establishments, but is there enough um, enforcement capacity uh, in the state for the unlicensed places? You know, I have a concern about this um, state of emergency in Southern Oregon right now with um, there's just not enough enforcement for the number of places that are around. Um, and, uh, you know, when it comes to public health and the water supply, um, uh, I just want to make sure that uh, Vermont's looking at all of those components. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Anyone else uh, who joined via the link? And did anyone join via phone? Uh, no, no one got by phone. Okay. Well, in that case, um, I'll close the public comment period. Um, again, we do have um, an ability for folks to comment through our website, ccb.vermont.gov, and um, there's just a button there to provide public comments. Um, any further discussion about our slides before we vote on them? Can we talk about the priority access for the yes. medical? Yeah. When you were talking, were you actually talking about a separate entrance or did you mean like there just needs to be some method of priority access the second okay. the latter yeah <laughs> uh, yeah and i'm in agreement with that we've heard a lot yeah. of, about this i think <clears throat> we all need to require that separate entrance if, if that's a business decision that somebody wants to make then i think that they can make that decision but i don't think we should require it just making special accommodations to right. to make sure that the medical patients are served without yeah. a new burden yeah skip the line situation yes you fast know, pass fast pass yeah um, but yeah, it could be a separate entrance if that's what, you know, the dis whatever dispensary wants to do. Um, so. And then on the transfers, just so we're all in agreement, that's, they can transfer up to our highest retail canopy size. And anything after that needs our approval. Okay. I'm comfortable with that. Well, I know my slides had a lot of like background information too. The, the, I think the, the ones that I have explicit recommendations um, that I'm asking to adopt are the integrated specific operational requirements slide, the denial of initial uh, licensure slide, um, you know, the enforcement authority slide, that's the one from Massachusetts, but it lays out, kind of fills out the list that you started. Right. Um, so, and like, you know, demanding books, uh, unannounced inspections, um, et cetera. Yeah, the, I, think, I think all of those will be part of our program. We just need right. to really understand how many folks are going to be participating and, and what resources, you know, we heard concerns yeah. about unlicensed and licensed folks, but what resources will we have through right. partnerships to, to do so? Yeah. Um, the suspension revocation denial of renewal criteria that I laid out and then the procedures for enforcement of violations mm -hmm. All right. and then it would be also to ad adopt Julie's slides I don't think we had any edits um, including no. the recommendation. Well, we, we didn't we moved the um, the one rule related to local governments to a like a strongly recommend okay. Strong, instead. Rec recommend instead of require um, and then I think the employee ID card can't remember how you had it phrased, but I think we were in agreement that it should follow the employee, not the business. Right, but that's a legislative recommendation. Well, that's a recommendation. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And then we're going to continue to discuss priority of licensure. Yes. <laughs> yep. And then on Kyle, just the year three slides adopted. All three of them. Yep. Okay. <laughs> they were pretty baseline. See, you get an A plus for today. <laughs> I'm sorry. You get an A plus for today. I'll take it. <laughs> So then, is there a motion to adopt those recommendations with the with the kind of amendments that we just discussed? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, I don't think there's anything left on the agenda, so we will adjourn this meeting. <laughs>